just a handful of influential people rather than the vast majority of the community that wants to preserve it as is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to comment? Um, well, he's pretty so, much okay. And, and we don't have anybody online, corporate office? No? Okay. So I'll close that, uh, that and we'll move on to the uh, business items. And, uh, and, and just, uh, we, we did receive the petition and um, I guess that will be made part of the public record, record somehow. No, no? Okay, petitions aren't, okay. <laughs> uh, so move on, uh, item 7.1, the waterfront, uh, waterfront concept uh, plan. I'll turn this over to our CAO. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm pleased to provide opening remarks on the waterfront concept plan. <clears throat> Council will recall that the plan itself was initiated to explore and consider 16 recommendations outlined in the 2018 Parks and Rec Master Plan. It's been to Council two times previously just to ensure uh, we were making course corrections along the way and uh, we also conducted all the work according to the scope approved by Council. We had two points of public engagement through the process where we received a lot of feedback and um, it's a strategic focus. So this is not a commitment to spend when council endorses this plan, but it sets the course for the future and from a vision perspective, and ultimately uh, specific decisions will be made through budget conversations and associated planning. So with that, I'll turn it over to our director of community services and her guest. Thank you, CAO Stat. Good afternoon, mayor and council. Uh, as uh, CEO Stat has mentioned, uh, this report is in front of you today uh, for Council to receive and consider endorsing the recently completed waterfront concept plan, which will be presented by the lead project consultant, Megan Turnock from Lees and Associates. Uh, the subject pro properties for the waterfront concept plan include Gordon Biggs Rotary Beach, Peach Orchard Beach, and 16997 Lakeshore Drive, also commonly known as Horse Beach. Uh, through site analysis, shoreline condition review, a waterfront safety review, and two rounds of community engagement, the waterfront concept plan outlines a set of recommendations for park design and management improvements for the district of Summerland to pursue over the next 15 years. There are 72 recommendations outlined in the report with priority ratings and high level cost information to guide implementation. The recommendations vary in their level of detail and range from design interventions to management strategies. So with that, I would like to introduce Megan Turnock, who is attending via Zoom to present the concept plan uh, to Council and then followed by an opportunity for Council to answer any questions that you may have. Over to you, Megan. Thanks, Lori. Hi, everybody. Um, having a little bit of technical difficulties today, but I think I can get through this um, as is. So I'll just share my screen so you can see um, the presentation in a moment. Uh, I'm really pleased to, to be back here and to um, kind of show you the, the culmination of uh, all the hard work that's gone into this project over the last six months or so. Um, uh, the presentation essentially will go up to give you a project overview, um, tell you a little bit about the engagement activities, um, talk about the key issues for the waterfront overall, as well as each of the sites, and then uh, as well as covering the plan highlights. So as you can see in the plan, there's quite a few recommendations. So I won't spend time going into each in detail on each one, but I'll try to hit the highlights for you. And then if there are any questions or comments, happy to hear those as well um, before we wrap this project up. So the project right now, we're in phase six, the final concept plan. Um, we started back early, uh, early in uh, 2022 with uh, project research and background analysis. We've done two site visits over the course of the project. We've also done two rounds of community engagement. The first to sort of gather information about key issues and values and what the community is interested in. And the second to test the draft concept plan recommendations and, and concept elements. Um, we've also met with council twice along similar lines. 
once early on and then once at the draft stage. And overall, the intention and the objective of this plan is to provide a long-term vision. It's also looking at both park management and protection of habitat, as well as setting priorities for you know, improvement of the park spaces. Um, the, overall, the recommendations can be implemented over the next 10 to 15 years. Some may be longer in timeline. Um, as mentioned before, it's not a commitment to spend. Some of these elements may be um, um, uh, implemented over time as, as budget allows. As I mentioned, we've done two sessions with council so far. I'm happy to see all of you again and some new faces. Um, we also have met with the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee twice um, through the process. We've had held, uh, held stakeholder engagement, which included interviews uh, with individuals as well as group interviews. We talked to youth, environmental groups, dog and horse owner groups, uh, neighbors of the properties, um, as well as some service clubs. We had an online workshop with 11 community organizations as well. We did have a public open house to present the draft plan and get feedback there. And in both rounds of engagement, we had an online survey, um, which we had fairly good responses on. Overall, I think the, the six, uh, sorry, the five key issues really came down to these categories, um, looking at amenities and accessibility. So there is replacement of the Qantas Pier, which was obviously one of the drivers of this project. Um, but as well, we looked at upgrading other aging infrastructure and amenities, and then improving accessibility for everybody. Water recreation is obviously a huge important, of huge importance at the waterfront. Um, some of the uh, key issues that came up were just improving the safety for swimmers, given that there are swimmers, non-motorized boaters, and, and uh, motorized boaters all in this area. Um, and reducing conflict between those, those teams and making sure it's safe for everyone was a top, uh, top issue. Um, with the popularity of these locations, improving, you know, finding any opportunity to improve the parking situation was a key issue, um, as well as, you know, exploring if there are any options for improving the vehicle circulation. Also connecting these places to other uh, areas of Summerland, including downtown, so people could bike or walk down to these parks rather than drive. It's also a key issue. Um, part of the, the driver as well uh, for these um, park concept plans is to uh, make these parks more resilient to, to flooding. It, they are all in the flood zone. Um, uh, and you've seen flooding happen in recent years as well. So where are the opportunities to to improve resilience and, and improve habitat value, as well as, as providing more shade. And finally, there was, there was the issues uh, around horses and dogs access, uh, particularly at Peach Orchard Beach Park and uh, the property known as, as Horse Beach. So with all of those considerations, um, we came up with this waterfront concept plan vision which we tested with council at the draft stage and have revised based on some of that feedback from council and the public. So Summerland's waterfront invites the community and visitors to enjoy the unique natural setting and small town character of a variety of lakefront experiences. The waterfront reflects the importance of the social, health, and environmental benefits to the community. Um, and the, among the goals that stood out for us was just to create memorable experiences for everyone. Um, that means all ages, um, encouraging active living, and making things inclusive and accessible, uh, improving access, safety, and resilience um, from a, a access uh, approach, including pedestrian, cyclists, and vehicles, as well as just make, making sure that the character of these beaches and parks um, remains uh, uh, protected. And Finally, the, the aspect of the environment, so looking at ways to improve the ecosystem health help the, and help the waterfront adapt to climate change. Deriving from that, we came up with these six objectives. They follow very directly from the key issues that came up and the, and the concept that we developed. Um, improving connections, improving universal accessibility, 
improving and upgrading the existing amenities, uh, improving safety of water recreation users, protecting and enhancing the waterfront environment, and directing and managing animal use of the waterfront. So in the plan, our recommendation sections are organized under these six themes. It was a little bit challenging because there's three sites and also six themes that we thought you know, collecting all of the information about accessibility in one place was more important um, than necessarily just des uh, describing each of the sites individually. So that's the approach we've taken. The executive summary does have the, the full list of recommendations in order and grouped by, by site as by uh, park location as well. So I think you'll see some themes coming through here from what the key issues that we've heard and, and the, the recommendations that came forward. So for the waterfront overall, improving the cycle path along Lakeshore Drive and connecting to town via Peach Orchard Road is, is a key uh, priority. That was also highlighted in trails and cycling master plans as well. So that's consistent there. Um, overall, there's a need for more information and better signage. So some signs are, are old and less readable and some information is missing. So we've collected uh, you know, in the in implementation plan, all the signage recommendations together to see what those, what those elements are. Um, sufficient accessible parking and site furnishings, really make thinking of accessibility for the site as a whole. So not just that there's an accessible parking spot, but the washrooms are accessible and there's picnic tables that, that people can get to. And then adding um, access to the water as well through beach, accessible beach mats. Um, clarity as well as finding those opportunities to um, represent First Nations on these sites. This should be done in, in uh, discussions with Penticton Indian Band and the Okanagan uh, Nation Alliance as well. There may be opportunities for place names, um, incorporating interpretive signage, um, art or uh, cultural elements on the site or even programming. So um, that recommendation is quite open. Um, uh, linking into the safety there, we did talk to the Life Saving Society and have some recommendations around life saving equipment um, as recommended for equipped waterfronts. So these are some of the basic elements um, that are recommended for any, any public waterfront where there's swimming, um, providing a protected swimming area for sure along the whole, uh, the whole waterfront, particularly from Rotary Beach to Peach Orchard Park. And finding those pockets, you know, there's not, the, the parks are so well used. Um, there's, uh, you know, almost every inch of the parks are, are currently occupied by amenities, but finding those opportunities for incorporating some more repair, repairing plantings and shifting from um, an approach that's primarily just protecting erosion spots with riprap into more natural solutions and opportunities for uh, trees and shrubs uh, is, a, is a main priority, I would say. That's gonna help with the overall um, resilience of these parks to flooding. Um, and finally, to clarify and communicate the animal regulations, particularly at Peach Orchard Beach Park and Horse Beach. One of these other waterfront um, recommendations I wanted to highlight was this uh, long distance swim lane. So in the first round of engagement, we've kind of heard inklings of this and, and it's, brought up, we didn't hear it too strongly from the public, but definitely when we went out for the review of the draft plan, we heard more, much more strongly, you know, why isn't this in here? We definitely need this. So we did bring that um, recommendation forward that there's an opportunity to have, you know, allow people to swim safely between these two parks and to um, really get the benefits of that. So, but what's required is to um, incorporate buoy lines and markers, improve the signage to clarify those areas. Um, you know, make sure that any hazards are, are identified. And also there may be some keep out buoys on the north side by the boat launch as well, just to make sure it's crystal clear that, that motorized boating is not allowed in those areas. As well throughout, there's elements of improved ecological value, but that's actually achieving multiple objectives. So improved beach sand is one thing we heard about Peach Orchard Park that was really desired. But in order to do that, I think there's going to be a need for some vegetative shoreline protection as well to make sure that that sand, if you do um, end up bringing more sand, uh, usable sand into that 
park that it actually stays on site and isn't just washed away. Um, but that can all be tied in with increased tree canopy, in, which improves habitat value. Um, you can improve the lawn condition by maybe raising the lawn and creating a bioswale to better drain um, excess water out of the park. The trees also naturally evapotranspire transpire all the uh, flood waters um, and improve flood resilience. Uh, also, the local environmental groups, really their highest priority for the waterfront was to expand a vegetative buffer along the lakefront. Um, they have some suggestions on plants and the, the Love You Lakes reports are, are a really good resource for the district in the future. So I'll shift into a little a short description of each of the sites now. I'll start with the key challenges, um, some of the top priorities, and then I have a plan view of each one that I can um, show you some of the key elements. Um, for Gordon Bay's Rotary Beach Park, really the Kiwanis Pier was one of the main drivers of this plan, as, as was mentioned. So that was a key challenge. What's, you know, what's the best way to approach that? What do people want to see in the future from the Kiwanis Pier? Is it um, congestion and lack of parking at peak times? Safety again. Um, for example, boaters coming up to the pier, which was not supposed to be um, happening, um, making sure that those areas are well identified. Um, mitigating, um, protecting uh, the park and riparian zones. Um, there was a distinct lack of riparian area along all of these parks, but Rotary Beach Park in particular. And we heard um, loud and clear like there's lack of shade and for park users and as well as limited habitat value. So Florin, flowing from that, you know, we did try to look at each of these parks and their unique character. So for Rotor Beach, really it provides a, a beloved sandy beach experience to enjoy with friends and visitors of all ages in and around the water. Um, one of the top priorities, of course, is rebuilding the Kiwanis Pier, adding access accessibility features. Um, such as uh, clarifying where the accessibility, accessible parking is, um, washroom upgrades include accessibility features as well as accessible beach mat locations so people can get to the water, um, and upgrading park benches and picnic tables to make sure that those have places for wheelchairs to pull up to those uh, features. Um, there are a few uh, tweaks, minor tweaks, that or overall add up to a better entrance configuration and pedestrian movement in the park. Um, in terms of upgrading, you know, attracting people or you know, serving the people that are there better. Uh, we've added a fire ring. We've added designated places for food trucks and increased shade through either umbrellas, some shade canopy uh, canopies, and as well as trees. There's also a, an opportunity the district to explore options with um, Summerland Recreation Society at the Lakeshore Racket Center adjacent and how that could be a partnership potentially to allow some overflow parking during peak times. We had quite a back, back and forth on the pier and what's what the best approach was. Um, originally, like for the draft plan, we did bring forward an, op an option to uh, rebuild the pier over the breakwater and combine those two structures into one. So we had a healthy debate. I wanted to make sure that that was at least considered and uh, because there are some benefits such as reducing the overwater structures, opening more water for recreation, um, there would be opportunities for more aquatic and riparian habitat improvements where the pier is, loca what is located now. You'd also end up potentially with a breakwater that would be more resilient. You'd have to be um, upgraded that as well. Um, However, we kind of ran into uh, the challenge really that it came down to, you know, there are more unknowns for this approach. So you would need a, a next stage of, of design for sure. Um, some shoreline uh, analysis by a, a shoreline engineer, coastal engineer. And from a cost perspective, there are some unknowns. It is definitely feasible, but it might take a, a little bit longer as well. So the timeline might stretch as well. So. Given the, the importance of the pier, the desire to move forward with a replacement as soon as possible and to have some clarity and, and certainty on, on costs, um, you know, the, the, um, to rebuild the pier over the breakwater would have higher short-term costs, but potentially lower costs in the long-term, but really 
um, the rebuilding in the current location, you can gain the many of the things that people wanted to see at the pier, which was more seating, um, places for people to jump and dive, um, adding lighting and a, and a rope swing. Those could be achieved with the simpler option of replacing the pier at its current location. So I, there, it, there is a description of both of those options in the plan. Uh, but the recommendation for now is, is um, to reduce the complexity and unknowns and to rebuild the, the pier in the current location. The brief um, description of the, the new pier design, this is just a concept design. There is a next stage of the detailed design and um, clarification of each of these elements, but there's, a, there's more seating, potentially a covered seating area, uh, year-round lighting, shade structures, jumping platforms, and a rope swing, and adding that protected swim area, particularly if you do have a rope swing, you need a designated, specific designated area for that. And then there's access to and from the water. So this design is an example. It could be refined through the next stages, but having a ramp, ramps going down to, to a lower water level platform on one side might be a nice way to, to bring people closer to the water. And it would be uh, accessible as well. The bottom two pictures are just some examples of, of other similar ideas, benches along uh, the walkway, for example, in the rope swing. And overall, um, it was really challenging to find any opportunities to improve the parking situation, but we did um, highlight some places where additional accessible parking spaces could be added near the pier, um, some food truck parking, um, and uh, connecting with a crosswalk um, at the south end there of uh, uh, the site across Lakeshore Drive. Added a fire ring, um, kept the fire ring out to the side here just because the beach gets area gets so crowded, we didn't want to uh, impact everybody's uses. Um, seating with umbrellas uh, have been added. The accessible beach mat is shown here. And then there are a few elements where you can add um, or carry vegetation. So along the south edge where there has been erosion and some riprap added, that could be interplanted with, with trees and shrubs. There may be an opportunity as well when you rebuild the pier to add vegetation around that location um, and to enhance, enhance that area as well. To Peach Orchard Beach Park. Um, so many of the same challenges in terms of parking. Uh, it's very crowded. It's a, a high use area. Boat launch in particular can be challenging because of the trailers. Um, there are some aging amenities such as the washroom playground, uh, the shoreline. People kind of complain that the shoreline was a bit muddy and not, not great for swimming. Um, and that puts extra pressure on Rotary Beach Park. So we are looking at opportunities there. Um, erosion protection as well has been placed in front of the playground uh, splash pad. And um, that's reduced, actually reduced water access for people. It's harder to get down to the water at those locations now. There's also some flooding, which we actually saw in our um, both, both visits, actually in the spring, spring visit in particular, um, observed some of the, the flooding of the site. There's also some better pedestrian movement, movement accessibility, and there's low biodiversity and habitat values there right now. Um, this picture actually shows some of the flooding that um, happened in the spring when we were there for um, review of the draft plan with the community at an open house. Um, ultimately, we heard, you know, what we heard in engagement was improve beach sand, you know, make, make, their, uh, make better play features, expand the swimming area, improve, improve the grass field, and, and add some additional picnic shelters or shade. So the vision for this park is ultimately um, that the park would provide a multifunctional waterfront experience, park experience to have fun, gather with friends and family, and get out on the water. And one of the main um, goals here was to make this park more of a destination, particularly in the summer, to take some of the pressure off of Rotor Beach Park. Um, some of the ways we are addressing the challenges are to, to, add, in, to add specific overflow parking areas, to bring in accessibility features for the washroom as well as um, accessible beach mats, and 
um, improve parking locations, um, washroom upgrades as well. The playground itself is, is aging and needs replacement. However, I would say the spray park actually has quite high play value and um, probably doesn't need a, a replacement in the short term. It could just be done as the mechanical and infrastructure components reach the end of their life. And then around the playground and between the playground and the volleyball area, just improving the circulation, providing more seating and accessible seating for people who may be at the, at the playground watching their kids. Currently, some of the, the approach to some of the benches is to have a bench with a concrete pad, but then the, that concrete pad isn't necessarily connected, well connected to other accessible pathways. So it makes it challenging to, to kind of, um, bridge those gaps. Also an opportunity to upgrade the boat launch to better accommodate boats in um, during lower water um, times, as well as adding a non-motorized boat launch. And then that there um, are beach and shoreline enhancement and protection opportunities, like I had, uh, mentioned before in that diagram. Um, so I'll just highlight some of the overflow parking areas. There's one that's already being used for overflow parking here on the north end of the park, adjacent to the, the driveway that comes into the boat launch. And then we also identified this overflow parking area, um, the west side of the, the park along the driveway entrance as well. Um, we heard strongly from the public that, you know, maximizing parking was not the top priority. They did want to preserve as much usable park space as, as possible. So the overflow parking areas are really underutilized areas of the park. We didn't eat into any of the, the lawn area or usable park space because of that. Um, I think the use and the number of people will only grow in these locations. So keeping that park space usable is important. Uh, we've brought in the accessible parking spaces here adjacent to the washroom, as well as the truck parking, um, easily accessible by, by the main area of the park. Um, and I just also wanted to highlight some of the enhancements to the shoreline. So in order to bring in sand to this beach and to build this beach out a bit, you probably will need some foreshore protection um, in order to maintain that sand in the in the long term. Um, uh, and so we've brought in a couple of smaller shoreline protection areas that are sort of a combination of, of rocks and vegetation as well. So you get double benefits there. We've added some uh, uh, fire ring areas at two of these uh, sort of interventions here could be really nice spots to sit sit by the fire. Um, other things to highlight, I think the accessible beach mat within the, the dog beach area um, is an important feature is um, make sure that all areas of the park have an ex have accessibility. Um, we also in the plan, it's not shown here, but in the plan, making a best point to one of the fire rings um, so that's accessible. Is also recommended. Yeah, I think those are some of the main highlights. Here's the, the non motorized boat launch here. The enhancement to the ecosystem is really in this area that seems to be the most prone to flooding anyway. So, enhancing a swale there will, I think, help um, drain the lawn as well as bringing some ecological benefits. So, so um, this would require moving the Centennial Trail alignment, so that might be a longer term um, priority there, and then connecting and better connecting to up to um, uh, up to town. Um, finally, Horse Beach. So, um, Horse Beach really is a we heard from the community is a small beach nook tucked along the waterfront for quiet, casual access for locals. Um, some of the challenges here, there, there are poorly defined site boundaries. There's two adjacent um, properties, residential properties. There are a lot of safety concerns here due to the bluffs on the other side of the road, which has been uh, identified as a high hazard area. There aren't amenities here to really support additional use. There are some invas invasive species within the riparian planting area. People can also kind of drive on the beach and have been able to drive on the beach. And then 
there's the tricky bit about um, uh, animal access and who gets access and when and, and, and how that happens. So, um, but what we heard really strongly was that there, there needs to be beach access for horses and dogs. And that was important to many people who participated in engagement. Um, people also mentioned a need to better manage off-leash and on-leash responsibilities, times and areas. So to clarify that. Really the one of the ultimate uh, deciding factors on this park was really that it is in a high hazard area because of the bluffs and the recommended approach is to not make this park a destination, to not invite um, additional use, you know, if it continues to have low use, relatively low use by locals um, on a casual basis, um, there is appropriate signage there, so the risks are, are clear. But in terms of, you know, adding washrooms and adding amenities to bring more people here, that really is not not um, not recommended because of the risks. Um, uh, we'd heard from horse users that this is basically the only location um, that they can bring their horses, and so that was important to maintain that access. But at the same time, there's an opportunity there to, to work with horse owners to, to manage waste at the park. Adding bollards to keep people from driving onto the beach, I think is an important improvement um, uh, as well. This, is, this park actually has some of the most, um, uh, the nicest riparian planting area here, and people do use that area for shade underneath the trees there. But removing the invasive species and restoring some riparian um, habitat there is also a priority. Did have quite a lot of discussions about access for dogs at this location. And we know that many people in the community are quite passionate about this place as a place where they bring their dogs. Um, you know, the results of the survey showed that, of course, people who own dogs strongly support continuing to or allowing dogs at this location and but we didn't hear that from everybody um those who don't own dogs strongly supported restricted access so it's, i think it's important to to come at this with uh, a balanced approach um thought the dogs on leash is a middle ground and um actually i have here that's consistent with the existing bylaw but actually the existing bylaw does not allow dogs on beaches at all unless they're designated areas. There is a dog beach at, at Peach Orchard Beach Park right now, and that provides that beach. Um, the current use of uh, this location for dogs off leash is actually in contravention of the, of the bylaw. And so far there hasn't been a lot of um, enforcement here. It's, it's on a complaint basis. Um, so it's important to, to keep in mind as well. We actually are considering the, if, if you go off the existing bylaw, there would be no dogs allowed here, regardless of the current uses. We're suggesting actually do acknowledge those current uses and allow dogs on leash. Um, there have been conflicts with adjacent property owners. There have been some comments about, well, why can't you can you know doesn't you know clearly mark the edges, and that just gets tricky with the water water line and the jurisdiction to completely um, fence off the park is a challenge logistically. Um, so that's this is where we, we ended up with it uh, after the draft plan. And we recognize that, that that's not going to meet everybody's needs, but I think it's a balanced approach um, moving forward considering. We've also um, suggested that Peach Orchard Beach Park has a have a temporary or a seasonal dog off leash area with a fence to provide some additional um, space for people with their dogs. The picture and the site is actually quite small. Um, it is a quiet, uh, out of the way place and intended to, to remain uh, that way. So the parking access will remain informal. Um, the bollards will prevent um, uh, driving onto the beach, we can put signage living at the edge of uh, the district owned beach is probably the limit of uh, the 
uh, marking of the edges there. And ultimately, you know, if you did end up designating this as an off-leash beach, I think it would become a destination. That's sort of where we ended up with a bit of conflict around inviting people and encouraging more use of this, this part because of the, the hazard. So um, those are that's a brief overview. There's obviously a lot more in the in the plan that I'd be happy to talk to, but um, in the implementation plan, um, there are priorities and listed one, two, or three. Um, the next step is just to confirm that those priorities are true and inc start incorporating these recommendations into bu budget deliberations, um, identify external funding opportunities, and I've just highlighted a few themes that I've seen, you know, grant money coming out for funding for, you know, climate resilience, accessibility, active transportation, safety, those are things that could be on the lookout for the district, as well as uh, external partnerships. So continuing to have conversations with Predict and Indian Band and Okanagan National Alliance around representation, opportunities for ecological uh, enhancements um, and other opportunities. Um, talking to Lakeshore Racquet Center about parking overflow and you know, horse owners, owners particularly about horse beach and waste management um, of that location. I'm happy to pass it back to you and for any questions or comments and I'll just stop sharing my screen here. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, Megan. Um, uh, council questions for either Megan or Lori. Councillor Peek. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, the handicapped parking at Beggs Rotary is at this north end. And if the mat goes down at the washroom end, would it not be better to have some handicapped parking closer to that point? Yeah, thank you for the question, Councillor. Actually, there are existing accessible parking stalls at near the washroom already. These were additional um, parking stalls near the pier. So thank they're you. both they're locations. They're not highly visible. They're not visible on your map at all, but they're not even highly visible when you're down there. So I appreciate that. Um, the other one was near the um, boat launch. You've got low fencing around the area that you would plant to be the swale to help whatever. Uh, why would you do low fencing? Why the cost for low fencing? Yeah, I think with the amount of use at that park, um, the low fencing actually is quite effect it's effective without being intrusive of like a six foot chain link fence, for example, to help discourage people from encroaching into the planted area. Um, it's just to maintain that integrity. So you don't want degradation. Correct. Of that area. Yep. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, you said that there was a mat down, and I couldn't see it. It may be the scale of the mat. A map down to the a mat for handicaps to uh, vehicles to get down there for the dog beach. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I just couldn't see it well within the, the picture. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you very kindly. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Trainer. I just have a couple comments. Um, the first one was just, a, I noticed you put um, fire rings in as suggestions at some of the um, beaches. Was that a public suggestion or was that just something that you added in? Yeah, we heard that the fire ring was quite um, popular at, at Peach Orchard. And um, so to add a few, a couple of more at Peach Orchard and then bring one to Rotary Beach. Um, something that is sort of a quick quick win that, that I think would be a popular amenity at both parks. Okay, we have, um, or down where I live in Trout Creek, there's um, a couple of fire rings at Powell Beach and they do um, get subjected to vandalism quite often. Like people will come down and have big fires and then spread the ash and junk that they burn all over the place. So that's just one thing that I think that council needs to be aware of is that they are, um, they can cause damage and also we have fire burns a lot of the time in the summer so 
Um, and then my second comment was uh, um, when you were talking about the peer, um, when you asked the public questions, was there a co like uh, was there any ever a question about like are you willing to pay for a new peer, or was there any kind of talk about the cost of that? You know, because uh, the level of dive deep of dive on that issue was not at this concept stage, I couldn't really give an accurate comparison of the magnitude of cost difference, and I still can't. So because of that, we didn't have a specific question about the willingness to pay. There was interest in, in combining those two features um, um, with a slightly more people liking the idea of, of combining it, but was it, it wasn't at the, you know, 80% in favor or 90% in favor, which would have been, you know, given us, or I think, the a clear message to go further down that road of combining them. Um, yeah, I hope that clarifies okay. things. Yeah, no, there. That, that's fair enough. That helps. Um, can I ask one more thing? Okay. Um, with regard to the boat launch at Peach Orchard, um, is there anything else that you can tell council that you learned about that? Um, I know we've had issues in the past with that in terms of congestion. And then at one point we also were discussing whether we should be charging for that. Um, we kind of have an unofficial boat launch in Trout Creek that gets used as well, but doesn't have any amenities or any parking. Um, so is there anything else that you can um, elaborate on what you found when it comes to the boat launch, like a direction that we could go with that? Sure, thanks for the question, Councillor Trainer. Um, so what we found was it is really a peak use issue. So I think the you know the the challenge is limited to you know summer summer weekends primarily maybe some weekdays um, during peak season. Um, the other challenge I think with the parking and charging for parking is the risk of pushing demand to places where there aren't uh, where they're, where they're free right which like Trout Trout Creek for example. Um, so I think if you would move forward with considering parking or reservations or anything like that, it would need to um, look holistically about um, the, the boat launches in, in the regional area, the broader area than just these three sites. Okay, thank you for that. Any further questions? Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Mayor Holmes. Um, Quick question to Megan then. So the property to the north of the parking lot, the boat launch is basically an unofficial parking lot overflow at this point in time. Um, is it recommended we leave it that way? Um, should we be putting some type of signage there to instruct people that it is an overflow parking so they're not out on Lakeshore Drive for say? Maybe it'll help uh, with the congestion on the main road. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the, the comment, Councilor Valpin. Um, yes, um, designated it officially. So it's not official right now, but it's being used that way. So making it official, giving it some boundaries um, and signage, I think is appropriate. And then you can also use the rest of that right away potentially for buffer plantings, which was also a, a suggestion for what that area could be used for. So you can kind of get the best of both worlds by designating some specific overflow spots also, if you mark them, it might be more efficient than just people parking haphazardly in that in that area. You might be able to get more vehicles in by mark, marking it. Um, whether you would need to add gravel, I'm not sure people are parking on the, the surface as is, so you might be able to just put the signage and some better marking without additional uh, uh, significant additional cost. Councillor Betts. Thank you, Mayor. A um, couple questions about the um, the intended peer replacement. Um, if that was to go forward, I see that there's um, a talk about year-round lighting on the pier. Um, was there a discussion about light pollution really being at the lakefront? Um, I know lots of people like to go down there to see the stars as compared to having them blinded out. That didn't, uh, thanks for that question, Councillor Betts. Um, didn't really come up um, through that discussion. It was more the desire to have it lit so it could be used uh, more in the winter. Um, 
uh, that lighting with it. But there are definitely lighting options that could be, say, under the, the handrail. Um, so it would provide lighting for feet and people would feel safe walking out there, but it wouldn't necessarily have the impact on viewing stars. So that's a possibility. Thank you. Um, second to that, um, with the with the pier and the concept of a floating dock for accessibility uh, down the side, is that something that, um, like, in terms of our winter ice buildups, would that be, does that come up in the winter time? Does it stay down? I just feel like it could be subject to different ice flows and damage. Um, I'm not sure that I can answer that question. That would be more of a um, question once it was designed and what design elements could be introduced to prevent that or, you know, is it for a season or not? I'm not sure. Depends on the design, I would say, next stages. Councillor Barkwell? Um, is there such a thing as um, barbecue pits that people would just bring their own charcoal down to instead of, say, having a whole fire pit? Um, thanks for the question, Councillor Barkwell. Um, I think the, uh, yeah, the fire pits are not intended necessarily as a barbecue station, it's more of a, a, a you know, just an aesthetic or fire for warming. Um, I think probably one of you could probably speak to to the prevalence of people bringing their own small barbecues down to the to the waterfront. But I think in terms of the busyness of the sites, I wouldn't encourage adding um, barbecue permanent barbecue locations in addition to all the other amenities that are there right now. Councillor Peak, another go around. Thank you. A follow up to uh, Councillor Betts' uh, comment on lighting. Uh, I don't know if we've ever considered uh, having a uh, dark sky policy, but certainly lighting that is uh, directed to the ground, not just at waterfront, but throughout the community might be something that would be youth worth considering. And I realize that's not part of this report, but I make that comment at a time when we're looking at lighting. And if I may, I, I'm not sure when we will have that discussion, Mr. Mayor, on the horse beach. So I wonder when that discussion will come up. Um, well, it's all part of the same package, so. Um, May I make comment then? Yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you very kindly, Mr. Mayor. Um, in terms of the horse beach, I do prefer the historic use of the horse, the horse beach in terms of not enhancing it and not making it a destination. <laughs> I think some improved seating, taking out invasive species, all the common sense things make very good reason to do that. Uh, I, I don't endorse having dogs on leash. I think that, that traditionally in this area, people have enjoyed the opportunity and dogs on leashes can't be swimming. That's just not a good thing to be doing. So I would certainly support the change from uh, having dogs that could be loose as opposed to putting them on leashes and not have them on leashes. Uh, thank you, okay. Councillor Trainer. Um, I agree with what Councillor Peak said. Um, I was going to bring forward a motion, if that's... Um, I actually have a few questions I wouldn't mind oh, asking okay. first. Yeah, um, okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, anybody else have further questions? Oh, okay, so I'll just ask mine and then... Uh, We'll entertain a motion. So, um, uh, first of all, in respect to Rotary Beach, um, the accessible <laughs> beach mat, the beach mat, um, I, I was just wondering the reasoning for the location kind of down through the middle of, of Rotary Beach. And when you think of like between the F dock and the breakwater, it's very close to the path there. It's very close to the parking lot there. You know, it, it'd be a very short, um, length for for the for a mat in that location. So I'm just wondering what the reasoning is having it right in the middle of the beach the way it is. Oh, thank, thanks for the question, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I think the location could be refined on site. That's uh, more of a representative uh, graphic than a specific alignment. So there's flexibility there, I think, for you 
for your uh, parks team to, to choose the appropriate alignment. Okay, uh, thank you. And then um, regarding Peach Orchard Beach, uh, again, I'm wondering what the reasoning is for bringing in sand for, to put along that beach there. Is, is the intention to um, provide uh, beach access uh, to the lake for people? And, um, you know, so it's, considering it's very rocky there, that, that sand, so I'm just wondering, or the, uh, the lake part there. So I'm just wondering what the reasoning is for bringing in all that sand. Yes, thanks, thanks for the question. It, it is really to make that uh, as attractive for swimming as Rotary Beach or close. The sand at Rotary Beach was also brought in, so that's not a natural condition either. And um, it can, uh, the intention was to reduce some of the pressure on Rotary Beach um, by bringing that sand in. Um, so just to follow up on that though, so what would, but the, the, the lake bottom there is very rocky and isn't really that attractive, no? Go ahead, Councillor Barco. Um, I think that the area that where they showed the small swale um, uh, breakwaters and, and the sand brought in, that part's more muddy. It's at the point where the dog beach is that it's rockier. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and then one other thing I, um, about horse beach. Um, so I, I totally understand, you know, the desire not to make it a destination off leash um, dog beach on the one hand but on the other hand we want to allow our lo local people to continue uh, using that uh, for their dogs as they have in the past and and so I, I understand the dilemma entirely and I guess the idea of making it an on leash is was to try to find that happy medium there but as as we all know when you try to please everybody you end up pleasing nobody so so um <clears throat> is it is it um we're always faced with on leash or off leash when we talk to dogs and is there any way you can find some sort of in between where you have a regulation saying for example, the dogs must be under control or something, or is that just wishful thinking? Uh, so I'm just trying to think, how do we get, how do we create a, you know, what I think most people are, are, are asking for is to create a community beach, you know, that'll serve our local population, but not become it, um, so well known as this um, great uh, off leash dog beach that's gonna attract people from all through the valley. So, so, so is there a mean, is, is there some, something in between? Uh, thanks for the question, I think. I don't know, that's a challenging one. Um, there's no, I would say there's no clear um, other, other way. I mean, I think the off leash always implies that the dogs are under control already inherent in that it's not that dogs can be off leash and and do as they like right so the that under control piece is embedded in in the off leash um rec would be incorporated into that um already um so can i offer another middle ground that might be better um there are some communities who have seasonal regulations so changing the rec regulations by season or time of day um, it gets complicated it makes it a little bit harder for people to understand when they can be there and, and can't and can there there may be some benefits to having that um, approach but it can also someone that can exacerbate conflict if if it's not clear enough so that's that's another possibility is a seasonal approach. Okay, and I just have one final thing before I ask Council Trent to bring a motion forward. Um, this is um, touching on, on um, something Councillor Trainer was talking about regarding the pier. And when I think when we first 
decided to to do this plan um, it, it it started I think in a budget conversation about the pier and and the condition of the pier and it would cost a million dollars to, to to replace it and we all kind of took a, a big gulp at that price tag and and we we, we felt that we needed to know um, what the how valued that pier was to the community for its heritage value, its its cultural value, everything like that, and and so so we decided, okay, while we're looking at the pier, we'll look at the whole waterfront, and because it's hard to separate one without the other, and and that that's kind of how this this whole project, I think, started. Um, now I understand this plan isn't a commitment to spend, and all that's through budget, but I'm and 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 the. And it came loud and clear that the community valued that uh, a peer, not necessarily that peer, but a peer there. But I can't help but wonder, um, you know, the question that was asked was that the Kiwanis Pier is aging and requires replacement. What would you like to see? And, and only 2% said, remove it and don't replace it. But I can't help but wonder what the answers would have been was the Kiwanis Pier is aging and it'll, it'll require a million dollars to replace it. What would you like to see? You know, I, I, so I still don't know if we've had the answer to that original question or not. Um, you know, and, and it's really hard for me for all, not just this plan, but all the plans we do, it's really hard to separate the plan, the vision, and it's, it's almost like a, a Christmas wish list with the actual dollars the money that we're going to have to put into it, and I don't know how we reconcile that going forward. But that's uh, it's it's something that's really frustrating, because you kind of adopt these plans moving forward, but you still don't have an answer to that question. Where's the money going to come from? So, anyway, that's uh, something I throw out there, Councillor Peak. I just wanted a quick question in regards to the horse beach. There was a an allusion by one of the presenters that uh, this, the area of the horse beach wasn't a park. Could I could just confirm that it's actually a park? I'll direct that to Lori, I guess. Yeah, thank you for the question uh, through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Peak. Uh, the north section of the park uh, is, does, or the property is designated park and the south section of the property is a road end. So it's kind of, if you look at that whole footprint, it's a combination of both. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Okay, uh, Councillor Betts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to forward your comment about um, really the question of bringing in sand or how do we move from um, deciding to rebuild a historic pier to an entire water waterfront development concept plan. Um, I think sometimes uh, citizens of our community put together a beautiful wish list, but maybe that's um, up to us to decide whether or not bringing in um, a huge amount of sand at that location is a wish list item or um, the best for our community moving forward. Only in, in light of that it's subject to high degrees of waves there and at the other site at Rotary Begs, you've got the breakwater. So for example, um, people who are giving their wish list of their best intended ideas and vision for our town that might not um, involve that as part of their, their thought process. So. I mean, it seems like that's what we're here to do. And I guess it comes back to the original question about the pier as much as anything. And where where do we decide to spend our dollars moving forward? So thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Barkwell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm not really excited about losing a large part of the lawn area to a, uh, I think you call it a swale. Uh, was there any investigation in the, and I recognize that some in, in the spring, June, maybe high water, that, that there's an area that gets kind of boggy, not every year, but some years. Uh, was there any um, information on what it would take to improve the drainage or raise the level or anything as alternatives? 
you yeah thanks for the question um you could raise the lawn and um put in drainage i think the approach that we've taken balances the desire to, to reduce um to make the park more flood resilient as well as gaining some ecological benefits um and there was a desire for more shade and and um, ecological habitat did come up as important for the community so it's a bit of uh it's not necessarily a, a one size fits all though the the lawn definitely i think would need, would be raised as part of that but you could the process of digging out the swale could contribute to raising the lawn area if you see what i mean the cut and fill balance a little bit so there's a little bit maybe of um less material you would need to bring onto the property to to achieve that go ahead i suppose when it came up to be a budget item to the cost of building this and moving the path and everything would have a deeper discussion but i see uh it's either a public use area or it's uh, off you know, out of bounds area and the fencing and stuff. So I don't see it contributing to the shade. I see it contributing to the mosquito problem. Uh, but we can debate that one, I guess, when the start talking about the dollars for it. Hmm. Councilor Trainer, would you like to bring forward a motion? Sure. Okay. Um, Megan, thank you so much for this report. I appreciate um, how much work it is and, and how you have to really balance so many different needs within our community. Um, it's also kind of frustrating when you get um, percentages back in public opinion that are like around 55 or 60%. You're just always hoping for 90 so that you get a clear answer, but that's the way it goes. Um, so um, I will bring forward that council endorse the water concept plan. Um, specifically for Gordon Beggs, Rotary Beach, and Peach Orchard. But I think that uh, the Horse Beach, which is 16997 Lakeshore Drive, still needs a bit of work. Um, and I'm wondering if we can either leave that section out now or put it on hold. Um, I, um, I think it needs a bit more discussion. And I'm wondering if we can just leave that beach for now, maybe put up some etiquette signs um, for horses and um, dog use, continued use, um, off leash use. I think that by bringing in a policy that says on leash, it kind of, um, I know that we were trying to reach a middle ground, but people bring their dogs there to go swimming and they can't swim on a leash. So it's kind of, I don't really see people driving all the way down there to walk their dogs on a leash along the beach. It's just kind of, um, defeats the purpose of going there. Um, and then, I mean, I think the idea of putting waste bins there for, for horses is really good and putting up the bollard. So there are some good things in that portion of the plan, but I think it still needs a bit of work. So I'm wondering if we can somehow leave that on hold or leave it, leave it as a primitive beach um, while adopting the rest of the plan. I don't know what council thinks about that. So that would be my motion <laughs> if we can do that. So, so, so essentially, you're you're saying the staff recommendation yes. uh, as a guiding plan for um, Gordon Beggs, Rotor Beach, Peach Orchard Beach, uh, and uh, receive the Horse Beach portion for information. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Okay, would yes. anybody like to second that? Uh, Councillor Peak, does that work? Uh, corporate officer has a motion. Yep. Okay. Any discussion on the motion, Councillor Barkwell? I don't see why it can't. We can't just do, um, have it as a guiding plan. It's only a guiding plan, and anything that has to do with horse speech would have to be implemented through further bylaws, such as uh, bylaw restricting access to um, uh, or, or you know making dogs be on leash. Well, I guess that's there now. Technically, we're told that they can't be there as it is. So if we adopt the whole plan as a guiding, it's up to us to whether we implement any particular portion of it anywhere along the way. And each one of them requires some action of council, uh, some positive action, spending money, passing bylaws. Just, yeah. Councilor Trainer. I agree with you, but um, 
then we're essentially en endorsing an on leash rule for that park. And I don't think that we're there yet. That's why I kind of just wanted to put that portion on hold. Um, and so we've accepted it for information, but we recognize that uh, still some work needs to be done on that section. Any other comments? Councillor Peak? Microphone. I haven't been here for a while. Um, I'm inclined to say perhaps we should leave the whole consent pl plan as a, as a vision because it always is in council's control as to what portions they would actually implement when it comes to the time. So maybe the motion as it stands does, is not necessary if we just take acceptance of the information and the concept plan, and as we work at the portions of it that come along that would be costing and decision-making. Having had this discussion about the feelings around the Horse Beach Park that we could get away without excluding it. Comment. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Betts. Um, I think I'm inclined to agree more so with a Councillor Trainer on this issue to separate them because the Beggs and Beggs Rotary and Peach Orchard Park concept developments are so much more engaged with um, parklands, bathrooms, waterfront, um, parking. Um, the other, the Horse Beach area is completely different in what we're even discussing. I think they belong separately. That's my opinion. I think we're all kind of on the same page. We just want to Make sure we, we get to that page. Uh, Councillor Van Alphen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So then maybe a question through to our Director of Recreation. Um, when can we have an answer for the public? You know, what's the timeline for the horse beach concept? We heard from the from residents today. They would like to see it left as a no leash dog park. Uh, when will we be able to give them an answer? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Van Alphen. Uh, at this point, the waterfront concept plan here is in front of you to, and, and there is a staff recommendation to uh, endorse the plan as a guiding uh, plan for consideration for future actions and investments for the three beaches. Uh, if that resolution was to stand as is, then we would be coming back to council after we've heard the discussion today to talk about uh, horse beach and uh, signage to place there. So right now we haven't put any signage up there. We've been silent on it because we wanted to see what, how this played out. Um, so I was anticipating coming back to council in a future meeting to talk about, uh, you know, what recommendations we would have. Right now our parks bylaw does indicate you can, um, dogs are not permitted on beaches unless other, otherwise designated or signed. So. Um, that was my intention was to hear what we, the discussion today and then come back at a future meeting. So, so my, my, my understanding is if, if we pass the motion at, uh, as Councillor Trainer um, introduced, we, we would be providing no direction to, in respect to horse speech and, and no, no recommendations or nothing would come back to us. Whereas, whereas for the other, for the Rotary Beach and Peach Orchard Beach, they, they would, you know, in, in budget or, or wherever. Is that um, a fair understanding? I see some nodding, so I'll take that as yes. Yes, uh, CAO. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I think it would put the horse beast beach issue into sort of purgatory. It doesn't provide the clarity I think we would hope for. Um, as, as indicated earlier, you know, even that property is divided into a road end and a park portion with sort of different rules on both. It's, it's an enforcement uh, challenge as it is. If that piece is pulled out as information only, we would kind of hit the brakes on that unless it's further directed. We would just be moving forward with, with the other pieces for uh, further clarity and decision making of council. Councilor Trainer. Um, during strategic planning, are we going to be discussing dog parks again? 
we needed to decide what we were going to do with our temporary dog park. And so I'm just wondering if that's um, a time, if, if we pass this motion and, and this section that horse speech goes on hold, is that a time where we could um, discuss that again and kind of give a second thought to what we'd like to do with that? Um, right now, I'm just proposing we just leave it as is until we have a further discussion with the rest of the dog parks. Yes, CAO? Yeah, through the mayor. Yeah, any, uh, any item of council can, uh, priority can be discussed in the upcoming session. So certainly this could be one of them. Any planning session worth its salt would include always a discussion, a healthy discussion on, on dog parks and related issues. And I know we can expect that. So that's certainly a way to do that is to just further the discussion on this item at that time and provide further council direction there too. Um, it's a good suggestion and one we could certainly support council's deliberations on. Okay, if there's no other comments, I'll call the question. All in favor of the motion. That's uh, four. That's there. Anybody opposed? Okay, one opposed, Councillor Barkwell. Uh, that carries. Moving on to the next item, uh, proposed procedure bylaw amendments, and I'll turn this over to the CAO. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm pleased to speak to this, and I'll just let the presentation boot up here momentarily. All right, make sure this thing works, good. I do have prepared remarks um, on this presentation and I would point out the report. All those six pages could actually easily be have been written into four concise one or two page reports, uh, but I, I, I expertly wove them together into a concise six page report for your ease of reading. Um, don't tell Mr. George Cuff. So uh, I, I do have prepared remarks and certainly we can pause along the way, perhaps the natural breaks at each portion of the resolution, which I will have on the screen or at the end, my remarks will take about 18 minutes. And just in terms of time, I've timed them for council. So in sequence with the election cycle, a good governance approach is to use this natural time of renewal to turn our mind to our procedures, processes and structures and to explore if changes should be made to support efficiencies. Staff have conducted a high level analysis and prepared some advice for council's consideration in the report before you today. And in my presentation, I'll provide high level remarks on advice on the following topics. First of all, um, talking about delegation of minor variance permits to staff. Next, incorporating a consent agenda into council meetings. Thirdly, shifting council meeting schedule, and lastly, to renew and confirm council committee governance. And if you have any questions, as I say, I, I'm presenting, but I do have members of my talented senior management team with me here today who will be assisting me in providing answers. So flowing from the development approvals process review stakeholder consultation report of 2019, the provincial government has proceeded with legislative changes that accommodate greater delegation of minor variance permits to local government staff. The policy intent behind the change is to accelerate the approval process in support of the supply of housing to the market. We've heard a lot about this. As a snapshot for here in the district, from August 2021 to July 2022, so that's a one year time frame snapshot, uh, there were 23 variances reviewed by council with 83% approved and only four denials. One of the denials was actually in line with the staff recommendation, meaning that council and staff determination of those variances were in alignment 87% of the time last year. Authorizing the delegation of minor variance permits will reduce application processing timelines from a current six week timeline to as early as three weeks. The change would also have the effect of reducing the volume of land use applications occupying council's agenda time and would by extension give staff back the time they are currently using to produce council reports and presentations for this purpose. The change complements other initiatives to decrease processing time such as the software development system project as we heard about today and also system specific targets and, and processing timelines that support our applications. 
On June 2nd, just for your awareness, the RDOS board did support delegation to staff on minor development variances. In defining what is a minor variance, the following considerations could be used by our Director of Development Services. Is the proposed variance consistent with the general purpose of the zone? Would the proposed variance address a physical or legal constraint associated with the site? Would strict compliance with the zoning regulation be unreasonable or unnecessary? And is the percentage of the variance requested actually quite minor? By way of example, a minor variance could be if an applicant was looking for a simple maybe 20 centimeter increase to the maximum retaining wall height of two meters. This would only be a 10% difference and on the balance of the examination of the request and other considerations, this is the kind of variance that we would see as a minor variance. So then what variances would still proceed to council? One thing I wanna point out here for council is that staff would still bring forward any variance applications for council decision as per the usable process if the staff recommendation would otherwise be to deny the variance or if it was deemed controversial or of wide public interest at the discretion of staff. So those two things, if it would uh, be something we would otherwise deny going straight to council or if we're seeing a lot of public interest and concern about a certain topic, a certain area, then a, our, our default response would be go to council. Our focus here is the customer, and it's to improve our timelines on those items that are obviously minor variances. So we are using council's time and focus to the greatest effect given your busy schedule. So on this one, the staff recommendation would look like this in the, in the motion that's in the report. And I'll pause and look around the room if there's any questions, and if not, I'll keep plowing and we could take them at the end. Okay, so any questions regarding the delegation of minor DVPs? Uh, Councillor Barkwell. Would the bylaw contain language discussing what um, a minor variance was? Yeah, I think that would be our intent, but I do still have our development services director on the line and uh, Brad, if you want to speak to this current thinking, how we would implement the, the change. Sure, yes. Uh, so uh, uh, through uh, your worship to Councillor Barkwell, you can see in this resolution that we have to bring forward uh, amendments to our, our development application procedural bylaw. And uh, under the new legislation from the province, you actually have to set up uh, guidelines to describe what a uh, minor uh, DVP is. So that's a, a legislative now requirement. If we are going to uh, go forward with uh, uh, implementing this legislation uh, and, and designating it as a minor DVP, we have to prescribe in our procedural bylaw what we define as a minor variance. So this would be something that I would be um, researching other communities, seeing there has been a few other communities, RDOS is one, Fernie's another, that have already uh, uh, went ahead with their own uh, amendments to allow for minor uh, DVPs to delegate it down to staff and, and look at uh, an approach for, for Summerland for uh, determining what, we, what would we consider a uh, minor uh, variance. Uh, it might not be necessarily the same, but we could have a, a discussion with council when we bring forward the, the draft amendment bylaw. Councillor Barkwell. On the other end of the scale, I was wondering if there is any way of um, changing our procedures for when there is uh, a, a variance that is of a wide community interest, and I'll use the example of the Oasis dock variance, that there be uh, more time for more notification, because that was, um, came, you know, published on Wednesday for a meeting on Monday after a rule change the week before, um, that just wasn't really very good because it wasn't just affecting a neighbor. Is there, is there anything that can be done that way? Uh, through your worship to uh, Councillor Barkle, yes, that's actually another thing we can prescribe within the uh, amendment bylaws 
is a further guidelines around what we consider a major uh, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum for DVPs and 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 perhaps have a greater uh, consultation requirements with regards to those type of applications. Okay, that's not in the proposed um, staff recommendation. Is there a way we can get that out there and something presented to us for discussion on that end of the scale? I guess that's a question maybe for uh, CEO. Yeah, we could just make note of that and make sure if this is ultimately supported that we include uh, suggested amendments to accommodate that piece as well. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah, okay, uh, Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Question through to our planner then, even on a minor, if this is adopted on a minor variance, uh, neighbors directed ar around that location are still gonna be notified, am I correct? Yes, that's correct. So uh, there is still um, a legislative notification requirements um, for uh, under the Local Government Act for adjacent landowner notification. Now, instead of those uh, uh, any correspondence from the the neighborhood um, coming to council, it would be coming to to me as a delegated person. And if there's a lot of you know, let's say a groundswell of of, of issues uh, from the surrounding community, I always have the ability as the development officer to to pause the um, the the issuance of the DVP through that consultation process and then bring it forward to council at that point in time. Thank you. So, yeah, just to clarify then, so if you, uh, you, you can, you can change course halfway through if, if it starts off being considered a, a minor one that wouldn't have to come to council and then all of a sudden there was a, uh, an outcry or something, you can change course and decide that it does come to council. Yeah, that's actually kind of the, the way that the regional district has created their regulations is, is to pull the neighborhood community first and then determine whether it would be able to be approved under a minor variance or and then um, then go or it could be considered a major and go forward to the RDOS board. So that's something similar to that could be something that we follow. Okay. Um, corporate officer, do, do we can somebody bring a motion just on this part and, and then we move on? Would that work or, yeah, okay. Uh, Councillor Barkwell. I'll move the staff recommendation as written to uh, review the uh, development variance permits. Okay, seconder. Councillor Van Elfen, any discussion? I'll call the question, all in favor? Any opposed? That carries. CAO. All right, we'll move along to uh, consent agenda. Um, a common governance feature for boards in the public and private sector is the use of what's called a consent agenda. A consent agenda allows routine and non-controversial items to be accepted in a meeting as a bundle without uh, in-depth discussion. Typical items moved uh, ma and managed through a consent would be the approval of the minutes uh, or final approval or acceptance of informational items the council's been dealing with for some time and where all the members are familiar with uh, the various implications. Maybe routine matters such as the rise and report function on appointments to committees can be managed through consent. Uh, similarly, correspondence that requires no specific action or decision. Uh, that can be accepted through consent. The benefit of a consent agenda is it saves time in the meeting because the review of these items can occur through the pre-reading of the materials by council. Presently, there is no consent agenda outlined in the council's procedures bylaw. There are some items the council typically does manage as what we might call information items, such as the acceptance or approval of council or committee minutes or the acceptance of correspondence in the evening meeting. From time to time, council will also rise and report on decisions emerging from committee of the whole meetings or closed sessions as the case may be. Uh, implementing the change is simple, it'll just be a minor change to the council procedures bylaw. And uh, ultimately on review of the consent items in that agenda, 
any member can ask that an item be brought forward for further discussion in that same meeting. Uh, this, a standing item would be called uh, items removed from consent agenda and that way it, that would allow any item in the consent to be brought forward at a member's discretion. So the consent agenda would be placed at the front of each council meeting and uh, here are some of the things that uh, it would include as I've already spoken to a number of them I won't go through that whole list. If the addition of a consent agenda is supported by council, staff would simply bring back the council procedure bylaw amendment necessary to implement the change before the end of December. And wait, there's more. Uh, maybe I'll just speak to this portion too because it's caught up in the same motion. According to the council procedure bylaw, regular meetings occur on the second and fourth Monday of each month with the afternoon meeting taking place from 1 to 4 p.m. and the evening meeting taking place from 6 to 9 p.m. In 2022, this resulted in uh, 21 scheduled meeting days. And that is the forecast for 2023 as well, if we keep our existing schedule and if we only have one meeting in August, which was the case in 2022. For the 2021 annual report, staff did conduct a count of how many meetings council had. And as you can see on the slide, there are in fact 99 meetings, individual meetings that is, of council. So council is very busy with things like committee of the whole, special meetings, closed meetings, uh, budget and planning meetings, regular afternoon evening, evening meetings, and, and of course public hearings. The current schedule that we have does prevent, present rather some uh, challenges as follows. The schedule leaves little time for staff to prepare thoughtful advice and research between actioning the decisions of a meeting that may have just happened and preparing reports for the next meeting. In addition to conducting the regular day-to-day -day duties uh, that are requirements of those staff in the operational business of the district. Two times in 2022, the Monday council meetings had to be moved to Tuesday because of conflicts with statutory holidays. When a statutory holiday occurs on a Monday that is a regular council meeting, the above staff preparation time is further truncated by a loss of a day that week. When a statutory a holiday occurs on a day that is not a regular council meeting day, there's still an impact to staff and the timeline of their preparation because the week prior is, is, uh, is pressured as well. And this actually occurred eight additional days in 2022. So I have this hard to read uh, diagram, hopefully inside of your packages, it's, it's, a, it's a, able to be read, but I will point out the colors at least. The following diagram is a rudimentary picture of how the current operational rhythm works in the preparation and support of council meetings and associated materials. Council meetings occur on the second or fourth Monday of each uh, each month. So the first Monday on this chart, as you can see that top line, the first Monday, it begins the rhythm. On this day, staff time is obviously dedicated to the support of council deliberations in the afternoon meeting from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. and in the evening meeting from 6 till 9. However, as you know, these days often include the opportunity for additional meetings uh, with Committee of the Whole, frequently closed meetings uh, in the afternoon according to matters of uh, legislative confidentiality. And some days there's also public hearings. Today's a good example of all these things. We have all of those on our agenda. The day after a council meeting, what happens? Well, the CAO, which is me, crafts an all staff email describing discussions and deliberations of council. I also review draft Facebook posts, which are prepared first thing in the morning to accompany the release of the videos to the public. From 10 a.m. till noon, the senior management team meets to debrief on all the council meeting items and to identify key actions and timelines to implement council's direction. In the afternoon, media inquiries or press releases are also managed to facilitate the dissemination of information to the public. And a new feature that we're introducing will be called the Council Highlights document that will also be sent to media and public as a digestible summary of the meeting so they can in turn publish uh, key elements of the Council meetings accordingly. Tuesday and Wednesday morning, as you can see, that sort of um, second and third block on that row, senior managers 
begin that process of engaging their teams to implement council direction through the operational side of things and sometimes follow up on council questions that were not answered in the meeting. There's a few of those today. Uh, there's also, this is the time when managers turn their minds back to the many emails and voicemails which await them after the, uh, after the early part of the week. By Wednesday afternoon, managers who need to turn in reports, and this is what I think is really the important part. This is when, by Wednesday afternoon, when managers need to turn in reports, turn to their reports rather, to the, for the next council meeting. They have to begin the research and analysis for the production of those reports, really by the end, or by the middle of that week after a council meeting. That often includes engaging other municipalities or stakeholders where information is required or research or on the legislation or sometimes procuring legal advice. Information received from the public or through council committees also needs to be collated so it can inform those reports. So when you see this green highlighting in that first week, that green highlighting is kind of the days that staff have to actually prepare those reports for the following council meeting. Thursdays and Fridays on this um, chart, as you can see, are more or less focused where reports need to be made for the next council meeting. And that's because the deadline for those reports is the Monday of the off week. So the, the Monday between council meetings, that is the deadline for those reports. Uh, so for ease of visual representation, as I say, I've highlighted on the slide, the days that in large part must fully contain work on the reports. Now, when a holiday falls on a council day, the council meets on the Tuesday and the fact right now is it pushes those screen days from three days to two, which is why I have that blue arrow sort of pointing right on that first row. And uh, when a holiday falls on a Monday that's not a council day, the arrow works in reverse, which as you can see on the second uh, row, pointing the other way. And that's because what we need to do in order to make our submission timelines is we have to make the deadline for staff the Friday of the previous week. So there's a, there's a pressure there. <clears throat> staff also uh, support council committees with their time, which I haven't gotten into here, but obviously that is also pr providing um, some significant time on staff's agenda to support those committees. So in summary, although council only meets every two weeks, because of the regular duties of staff and the statutory holiday schedule, the report production Review and approval and publication timelines means that staff are challenged to produce all advice and reports really within three and sometimes two days between council meetings. As a result, it's common for staff to spend their weekend time preparing reports and presentations for the Monday deadlines or sometimes canceling holiday time in order to work within the existing operational rhythm given the busy uh, agenda of council. So I'd submit this is not a sustainable approach for staff, nor does it foster work-life balance and support of staff retention within the organization. So I have prepared uh, for the purposes of discussion an alternative approach for council's consideration. An alternative approach is to have regular council meetings every three weeks, perhaps on a Tuesday. Uh, I've mapped this out and you can see in attachment one of your package in this configuration there is still 18 regular council meetings in 2023 and as an added benefit none of those meetings would conflict with a statutory holiday. This compares to 21 regular meeting days in the current configuration with in that configuration three statutory holidays set to displace meeting days as you can see in attachment two. Note that I've retained the Monday meetings in January and February, and that's because we've already baked those into our budget timelines with council, and we need that time in the schedule in order to uh, brief council on, on the budget that we're working through. So I'd recommend that if council does support this change that we would begin the shift in March of 2023. And if council supports these changes, a bylaw amendment to the council procedures bylaw would be prepared for council's further consideration. Finally, on this item, I do have some benefits to the alternative approach. So it's submitted that a small reduction of three less meeting days for the entire year would help reduce the demand on council's already heavy schedule, while at the same time uh, producing more sustainable operational rhythm for staff. 
Additionally, with the introduction of a consent agenda and the additional delegation uh, to staff of development variances, if those are ultimately fully accepted, this should equate to less council time on uh, agenda time needed for those elements because some of those pieces be pushed into the staff uh, side of things. With staff having the additional time to research and write materials, the advice would be better. More time for quality control of materials will also improve the overall professional presentation of documents and avoid minor errors that could otherwise delay progress in the public dissemination of notices or inadvertently result in wrong information being provided to the public or council, which of course we do not want. I'd also point out that if the regular council meeting day moves to, for perhaps discussion purposes, Tuesday, the existing deadline for staff to finalize and publish reports and presentations would still be maintained on the previous Wednesday. So what this means is this provides the advantage of one additional full day for council to review their packages prior to the regularly scheduled meetings. Avoiding the inconvenient scheduling conflicts caused by statutory holidays landing on a Monday, of course, benefits everyone. And moving to this schedule would also help staff um, avoid the situation where they're preparing their reports on the weekends, which in turn uh, does not help with uh, work-life balance considerations for staff, let alone attraction and retention of those staff. To avoid any confusion on the part of the public or media, we would clearly communicate the change and then post the entire schedule for 2023 in a prominent place on our website. We'd also continue to use Facebook as to support public awareness of the meeting times to ensure clarity. And finally, I'd just point out that if an urgent issue does arise, we always have the ability to call a special meeting with council. As mentioned previously, if the change is supported, it would not take place till March, 2023. And that also means we could use the balance of 2023 as sort of a trial year to see if this schedule works for council, ultimately making any amendments or tweaks that we need to, or even perhaps reverting back to the original schedule at council's discretion. And this is what the motion would look like on that. Happy to take any questions at this point. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Barkwell. Um, on the one hand, I have to say, staff would know best their schedule and what works for them. But on the other hand, the presentation was premised on, we make a decision on one council meeting and staff has to go away and write a report and then, and complete everything within two weeks at the next for the next council meeting but that's not the way things go uh, it's nothing is dealt with within two weeks of a council event or decision so um, the work all has to be done sooner or later and uh, looking at the schedule I see there's like one two three four five months where we'd only have one meeting so it kind of seems to me like we'd wind up with fewer but longer meetings and longer meetings are not good. I don't think you get good decisions out of a bunch of fatigued counselors who just want to end discussion and go home. Um, so from that point of view, I'm, you know, I'm not really enthusiastic about the idea. Uh, is it, Preparation from a staff point of view, having more meetings, but covering the same amount of material, is that like more difficult? See uh, Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd come back, I'd circle back to, uh, and through the mayor to Council Barkwell, I'd circle back to your early comment um, about longer meetings. So I, I guess I would just say, if council goes with the full embodiment of the advice, which is also the consent agenda and the further delegation to staff, I actually believe that those meetings might not necessarily be longer. I think we might see efficiencies in those meetings. Already we're seeing some efficiencies in the way these meetings have been run with reducing and confining and, and uh, bringing concisity to the agenda and the way Mayor Holmes has been running the meeting. So I, I think that uh, my opinion position would be, we probably would have roughly the same uh, length of meetings, a few less meetings, but also to, to your point about the calendar, in some months under the current configuration, we have one meeting in a month. So 
uh, for example, I think Silga and maybe UBCM are examples of that going off memory, maybe December timeline and August. So it's not an unorthodox feature in our current calendar, but it would make a lot of difference to staff because although all the work has to get done, what that additional week does for us on the in-between period is it allows staff to really be able to have that additional time for that focused and thoughtful advice, preparation and research, time for the dialogue. Even though the overall council agenda, there might be overlapping items between, well, today we're, we're focusing on a meeting that might have happened two or three meetings ago and implementing that and getting ready for the next one. It's not so much a, a simple regimented approach like you've identified, but on the balance of work on the effort are, that we're putting into this, spreading those meetings out in a, in a more systematic way to give us that it weekend between would, would uh, do a lot for us. And that, that is in full consultation with the management team. I can confirm that this is something that would make a big difference to us. But it's not just about us. So it is also about what uh, works best for council. Certainly here, here to hear that today. Yeah, any follow up? Councilor Barker? Um, the, I, I, I don't know if everybody saw it, but there's an email from Councilor Patton and suggesting that uh, that might result in delays um, with the time, uh, you know, before the space between uh, council meetings being longer. Uh, it's actually six months of the year where there's only one one meeting. I missed one month when you mentioned Soga. Um, do you have a, any comment on that? That the you know having to a month between council meetings means that sometimes uh, applications will get held up uh, through the mayor. Yeah, my comment would be again, you know, with further delegation to staff on minor variances, a lot of that is where the, we get the clang in the system on the development side. There's a minor variance they need. They're moving with speed and violence. They have investors that are waiting with bated breath, and then we have to tell them. You know, we, we can't get onto the schedule of a, another council meeting for maybe two weeks or maybe four weeks. So I think um, dealing with those minor variances to staff uh, will help a lot in, in dealing with that issue. If something is of particular import, and we've seen some of these things in the past, we do always have the ability to uh, call a special meeting if we need to. But um, we would try and we would try and not do that uh, to be respectful of council's time and the operational rhythm that we're setting forward. Councilor Barkle. Are you suggesting now that there's applications that are ready to go to council, but the council's agenda is full and so that you have to wait a couple of weeks? Uh, I'd probably look to my director of development services for that. One came up fairly recently. I'm trying to remember right around the election time that was a fairly minor variance. Um, maybe Brad, you can help my short term memory here that we did have to push uh, the timeline back to an upcoming council meeting. And it was, um, you know, a bit of a frustration for that developer. Do you want to help me on, on these uh, ones, Brad? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, if I can help uh, answer that question. Um, there, yeah, there, there has been minor variances in the past uh, that, um, because of the notification requirements um, and also council scheduling that uh, that we we didn't have the right time period um, for for us to be able to hit the, a certain meeting. Um, I can't remember which one specifically you're referencing there, uh, CEO stat, um, but uh, it has happened in, in, in a couple times in the past. I do think like uh, CEO stat has mentioned that. Uh, delegating uh, DVPs will help for for rezonings. Um, you know the three week thing may as well line up with public hearings and the setting of public hearings. I'm not too sure. We'll have to check with our corporate services department on that. Um, but potentially where where you could actually set your public hearing at the next meeting instead of the every second meeting, which would actually improve the efficiency of rezonings. So. Um, that would be one another potential benefit. Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't know. I think with the adoption of a consent agenda 
and what is being proposed here, I don't have a problem with it. It's up to us. If we if it works well for us, it works well for us. If it doesn't, we can change it back. But why not give it a try? If it looks like it could help us, I'm game. But uh, I think the consent agenda will definitely help with some some of the timeline issues. Um, so I'm in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Trainer. If no one has any further comments or sorry questions, I'll bring a motion forward. Any other questions? Councillor Peak. Not a question, but a comment. Um, I came to this council table knowing in advance what days I would be needed for council. This change will make a difference for my other job, and it may make a difference to the point where I don't have another job. So I may have some decisions to make around that. This has no bearing on making the decision because in the sense that I that I believe the request is a valid request and I think the changes uh, to have a um, both the legislative opportunity for minor variants to come forward and for a consent agenda will improve things for both our council and for the timeframes of staff work to get done. Uh, I know I had a, a brief discussion uh, with staff uh, about my concern and they said another way that could be possibly worked on would be to have um, a, a motion to have every third Monday for council meetings as opposed to Tuesdays. So I don't know if that reflection is possible discussion. Um. And perhaps I would ask the CAO to enlarge on that because it was a brief discussion and I don't have all the balances in no, there. No, that's a fair question. Um, CAO? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Holmes, and through to Councillor Peak. Yeah, the, to us, the, the, the key thing we're after is sort of that every three week uh, meeting schedule as a trial for 2023, starting in March. But we could uh, have that on every three week Monday as opposed to Tuesday. I think we'd be agnostic about that because of that extra week in between. So if every three week on Monday would be supportive uh, for schedules of council, we could certainly just do a minor amendment to the, um, to the motion. And it would still start in March. I did a quick look at the calendar. And I think if we start on March 13th, I believe, which would be that, if we called that the first Monday, we could go through the entire year still without um, impacting a statutory holiday on the every three week, except for the one in August. So that would be for your own personal schedule, one that would still bump to the Tuesday anyways, which might be uh, more manageable than every third Tuesday. So for us, yeah, if, we, if it was every third Monday starting in March, say 13th, that would be um, just as good. Uh, Councillor Peak. Would that be something the council would consider every third Monday as opposed to start on the Tuesdays? Um, so, so my only comment on that would be the, you know, what happens when the Monday falls on the statutory uh, holiday. And um, if it's, uh, we can maybe dodge that bullet this year, but what about moving forward? We might not always be able to dodge that bullet. <laughs> Uh, so that'd be my only my only question because one of the things we are trying to avoid is those statutory um, holidays. But that would be my only comment. Uh, if anybody else has any uh, feedback, Councillor Barkwell and then Councillor Van Elfen. Um, it doesn't make a difference to me. Matter of fact, I think maybe Mondays would actually be better. And 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 the CAO has said that it didn't um, impact them with they were going with three week periods that uh, some would be uh, um, moved to Tuesday. So I'm good with the Mondays. Councilor Van Elfen. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm good with Mondays too. And I appreciate uh, Councilor Peak bringing that forward. I, I did kind of didn't uh, register with me. And I apologize for that. But, uh, you know, we have to consider other people's other lives too. So I, I, I'm, get, I'm good with Mondays. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, no, I, Bundys are, are fine with me. I, I didn't, um, I'm, it means I can still play tennis men's league Tuesday nights. I didn't want to appear self-serving by mentioning that, but <laughs> so Councillor Peak. I'd like to say with my experience of over 20 years doing council, that the work that's required by councillors and staff has really increased. And I, I know that, or I feel that the work of councils are becoming more full-time and less part-time. And that's an observation, not a fact. I just feel that may be so. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And, and also, I just want to make a, a comment on the consent agenda. Um, as most of you probably know, the RDOS has a consent agenda, and I, I think it works very well. And, and uh, if it's something we adopt, I, I don't think anybody should hesitate at all to remove something from a consent agenda if they want to discuss it. It happens um, fairly regularly on the RDOS. Um, so it's, um, and nobody bats an eye. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's not something that should, or, you know, that you should, um, if you want to discuss it, you can still discuss it. So. Uh, Councillor Trainer, could I invite you to bring forward a motion? So I'll bring forward the staff recommendation, except for um, changing um, the day to Monday instead of Tuesday, if that works for everyone. Do you need me to read it out or is it okay? Uh, I think it's okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, secondary council Van Nelfen, any discussion? I'll call the uh, question, all in favor? None opposed, that carries. CAO. Thank you. Um, all right. Discombobulated my presentation here somehow. Oh, it's because this is upside down. There we go. Uh, that's that's better. Now I'm going the right direction. Okay. This is my fourth and final element, uh, as you will also see in the report before you, Council Committee Review and Renewal. So the community charter is prescriptive in the composition and nature of committees, commissions, and other bodies. The council procedures bylaw in turn outlines the duties, notice requirements, and reporting requirements of these bodies. Now over time, the district has created, disbanded, and recalibrated committees and commissions and has from time to time adjusted their terms of reference for their membership, which is, which is totally good and very healthy. But the community charter establishes a type of taxonomy according to whether the body is established as a commission, a standing committee, or a select committee. However, presently our committees are not clearly identified according to this classification. The community charter also identifies the number of council members that must be on a standing committee or a select committee. However, it's unclear if we are compliant with the legislation as the terms of references for our committees do not currently indicate the committee classification. As per the community charter, standing committees of council are established for matters the mayor considers would be better dealt with by committee or at least, and at least half of the members must be council members. Select committees of council are established to consider or inquire any matter and report its findings to council with at least one member of a select committee being a council member. So these are the current council committees that are listed on their website. I won't go through all of them. Uh, I know you're familiar with these committees, but there are a number of them. Each committee has its own terms of reference and or is established in some cases by bylaw, but they currently lack any consistent structure and format. As we've just experienced an election which has resulted in a new council membership and of course may bring new council priorities, these committees and their composition may naturally change. So it's the recommendation of staff uh, that uh, effective November 14th all council advisory committees be put on hold. Now I note this is council advisory committees. But I'd also just point out that the Board of Variance is a requirement under the Local Government Act and the APC is established under bias bylaw, that's the Advisory Planning Commission bylaw. So it's recommended that these two committees 
on the commission be accepted from the pause and review process. So in other words, all our advisory committees, except for looking at the Board of Variance and APC, we'd let those continue to roll as they're a little bit different. Strategic planning for council on their new mandate is scheduled uh, for the 24th and 25th of November, which also highlights uh, the opportunity for council to talk about their priorities, uh, maybe reshape and renew our focus. And of course, uh, what we might want in terms of committee focus and membership. Based on the analysis and council's priority setting, staff would aim to bring back recommendations in a complete format to council before the uh, before April 20, the end of April 2023. So ultimately our staff recommendation here is listed as follows, that with the exception of the Board of Variance and the Advisory Planning Commission, that we would pause other council advisory committees um, and ultimately with direction to staff to renew and, and review and analyze uh, the composition of those committees and return to council before the end of April 2023 with advice. And with that, I conclude my presentation, but certainly still have opportunity for any points of clarity and discussion. Any questions? Councillor Barkwell. Is it really necessary that the uh, committees be paused while this review is done? I think about the uh, um, Community Climate Action Committee, or I'm not sure if I have, you know, they're, they're a keen bunch involved in something that they want to do for the committee. And if they I don't, wouldn't want to be the person that told them that, you know, November, December, January, February, March are all gone for them. That's a long hiatus. Um, uh, I, yeah, it's just, and then and other committees wouldn't really make much difference because they're not that active. I wonder if there's a middle ground here somewhere. Council Trainer. Uh, my question is for Lori. Um, with the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee and um, the progress that we're making with the Recreation Centre, do you see that, um, especially if that's going to become a lot busier in the next couple of months, do you see us needing um, that committee and their, you know, their insight and their additional opinions? Because that's a pretty active group and they all have a lot of experience. So I'm wondering if we were to pause these, would we be missing out on some valuable um, insight from them? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Trainer. I haven't thought that far ahead as far as the next steps around engagement with the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee. We typically meet quarterly. Um, so if we were to meet in the new year, because um, we've just met, um, there may be some agenda items around the referendum and input around that, but uh, I don't have the agenda set right now, so I can't really speak to it. Uh, I'm just the CEO, I guess. Is is there any reason uh, that we would need to pause the committees while we review them? Or can we just review them? Uh, can they just keep ticking over until it's reviewed? So for the mayor, so to respond. we could keep them going. There could be substantial changes to either their membership or the terms of reference um, that could maybe pose some issues for the committees. Um, I can think of one an example. Um, if council were to decide they wanted to maybe change the scope of what that committee could review, I think um, I'm not sure it would sit well with the committee. So to pause it to say we are undergoing this review to review if these committees are serving the new council, the new priorities needs. I, I think maybe some it would be easier to to do that. Whereas if we completely change the scope, if council decides. Um, uh, I, I don't know if we will use the Water Advisory Committee, for example, it's one I'm, I'm pretty familiar with. Um, I think if we maybe change the scope, it could really upset the committee of what they're viewing, whether they're a standing or a select, or if we keep it as an advisory, but maybe limit to what's going to them, or maybe council wants to keep it broad, but have them more active. But one of the things I'm finding with the committees is that some of them, not all, have a pretty, they have a lack of direction from council, so therefore they're trying to find their own things to come up with that maybe aren't actually serving the priorities of, of council. So uh, from my perspective, it would be easier, I think, 
to stop, review, let them know that there could be changes, there could not. Also, if, if we do find um, through the strategic priority process that maybe this committee we do need, we could maybe even start that one sooner, review that committee first, but that would be my thoughts on it. Any, uh, Councillor Betts. Um, I think that this concept of putting the committees on pause um, provides an opportunity that Mr. Cuff was sharing with us to um, take the opportunity to refocus, to decide truly what our priorities are and to share that with the committees and those who, um, who are providing such valuable input to what we're doing. So being able to share that scope or to shift that scope depending on what our priorities are, which we don't yet, we haven't yet set as a group. Um, if we can take that opportunity, it's a pause, which then allows us to set a more firm direction without, without ruffling as many feathers. So um, I do support that just to give us some time to set our new priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Barkwell? Well, um, each time there's been an election, there's been a review and, and slight changes. Uh, committees have, as um, CAO said, have been created. Committees have been disbanded. The Heritage Commission is gone. Shouldn't have been called a commission because it was really a committee. Commissions have different things. I don't know if our APC is actually a commission, but yeah, each time there's a new council, there's, as Councillor Betts said, uh, a refinement and new objectives set. and. But they were, I don't believe they were ever all paused for such a long period of time. And uh, I, I don't think I would support a pause. Uh, it doesn't seem necessary. And we can make changes at any time. Anybody else? Would somebody like, uh, Councillor Peek? I do believe a pause does, uh, uh, an, it signals to the committees that the council has an opportunity and wants the opportunity to prioritize to based on their discussion for strategic planning. And uh, when you have a new council, I think that is an opportunity that we should be taking advantage of. I do understand Councillor Barkwell's uh, statements around in, in the past. Sometimes they have not all been paused, but I think it's cleaner and clearer if we allow that transformation and change to be done for a period of discussion and a refocus. Thank you. Um, so I, my, my myself, I can certainly uh, understand the logic of pausing. I, I, I guess the, the one concern with it is that we don't want to lose good people. I mean, there are some good people on some of these committees. So, um, so the question is, how do we pause? But we make it clear that um, there, the, there, these committee meeting members are valued and and don't give up on us. So I, I think that needs to be made. If if we do go that route, we have to make that clear. Um, I don't know how we do that, but I'll leave that to the smart people on our senior management team. <laughs> Would somebody like to bring forward a motion? <laughs> Councillor Trainer, putting all the work on her. I will bring forward the staff recommendation um, that the committees be put on hold until the end of April 2023 with the exception of the Board of Variance and the Advisory Planning Commission. Okay, do I have a seconder? Councillor Betts, any further discussion? Councillor Trainer. Just quickly, um, I guess with the word pause, it means we can unpause at any time. So if for some reason um, something comes up with, um, I'm just again thinking about the Recreation Centre, because that uh, committee does have such valuable people on it, if there's something that comes up and Council decides that we want their thoughts or their opinions, we could always, I, I would assume, unpause them temporarily and then, you know, put them back on pause. Would that be okay? I just like, you know, what, what Mayor Holmes said, I just don't want to lose these people during this time. And if we need their help, we could always ask them. Does that work? CEO. Uh, thank you through the mayor to uh, Deputy Mayor Trainer. I would say these are council's committees, so uh, they exist at the pleasure of council and certainly could also be reformulated even during the pause period if, if necessary. Uh, 
It's a it's a well deserved sabbatical for the committee's uh, time of renewal and refresh and refocus. And a large portion of the pause period, of course, is the holiday break anyways, where in most cases the um, committees wouldn't be meeting. So uh, we would make sure that we, we effectively communicate around this in, in the most respectful way because the work of the committees is valued. Okay, no further comments. I'll call up Councillor Parkwell. It just seems like uh, until April is a kind of a long pause. It just feels like a very long pause. <laughs> I'll call the question. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? One opposed? That carries. Uh, so we're running um, 30, 42 minutes behind schedule. So uh, we'll have a five minute break and um, be back at 3.17. Thank you.
the new 7.4, that's the RDOS weighted vote assignment. I'll turn this over to the corporate officer. Uh, thank you, the Mayor. So the District of Summerland is entitled to two voting members on the Board of Directors for the Regional District of Okanagan's Milk Meme and is assigned seven weighted votes to be split between the two directors. The Local Government Act requires that the votes must be assigned to the directors as evenly as possible and that the difference between the maximum and minimum number of votes must not be greater than one, meaning that one director will be assigned four votes and the other will be assigned three. Before Council, um, I placed this sheet all on your desk and it was emailed out. Um, is the staff recommendation that the four-year appointment be assigned the four weighted votes and the alternating two-year appointments be assigned the three weighted votes? And with that, I am happy to take any questions. Any questions? Somebody like to bring the motion forward? Just stick up your hand. <laughs> Councilor, <laughs> Councilor Betts, Secretary, Councilor Trainer. any discussion? <laughs> Wasn't painful, was it? I'll call the question, all in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Um, 7.5 council appointments, uh, corporate officer. Thank you again. Um, so again, before council's consideration of appointments to local community organizations and external agencies, either the mayor or an individual council member are appointed to represent council in the district on the various community-based organizations in the community. Organizations with a non-voting council Council liaison include the Friends of the Summerland Ornamental Gardens, the Kettle Valley Railway Society, the Summerland Chamber of Commerce, the Summerland Community Arts Council, and the Summerland Museum and Archives Society. And organizations with a voting representative or delegate include the Municipal Insurance Association of BC, the Okanagan Regional Library Board, and the Southern Interior Municipal Insurance Association. So staff are requesting that Council appoint a member to the, to the above noted or the previously noted community organizations. Okay, thank you. So um, I, uh, I'd like to propose um, a way we could do this. I, um, I've spoken to everybody individually and, and sort of have an idea of everybody's interests. Um, there are some where um, some people are interested in, 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 uh, in, in more than one and others where nobody's really interested in any. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what I'll do, what we, what we can do is just go through them all. I've kind of penciled in names in all the slots there. Do you have, if you, if you look at that first page with, with the motion, all the blanks. So I thought maybe we could just go through penciling them all in and then go back and look at them all at a whole and we can shift around if we, if we want to. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay, so uh, so the first one, so the Friends of the Summerland Ornamental Gardens, that was something that um, just, I think last year, I think uh, um, that was brought to us and Councillor Trainer um, was appointed at the time and she's indicated she'd like to continue in that and uh, seeing that she's just, it was just, just barely got started. Um, I would, I'd recommend that we keep Councillor Trainer in that spot. Um, this the museum now there was a um, a few people who are interested in 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 the museum uh, Councillor Barkwell has been in that position for uh, the last term and uh, I know the museum has people have told me they're very happy with <laughs> Councillor Barkwell and has since Councillor Barkwell hasn't expressed any interest in any of the other positions <laughs> I would recommend that uh, we, we keep them there for for now uh, with uh, Councillor Peak as the alternate so we just pencil that in um, so for the Arts Council, um, Councillor Peak is, it's, uh, it's an organization that's dear and, and well known to her heart, I believe you're, I don't know if you've stepped down from the board yet, but your intention is to, uh, yeah, so uh, she's already on the board, so she would just be sliding over um, to a non-voting role uh, in that case. And would anybody be interested in serving as the alternate on the Arts Council? You would? Uh, Councillor Betts. So, so, so the uh, the alternate would is just if Councillor Peak can't make the meeting, sure. she would just contact you and and uh, and they meet uh, Tuesday evenings, I believe. First Tuesday is every month. Is that correct, Councillor Peak? Yeah. 
It's, it's, I know it's Tuesday. I, I think it's the first Tuesday of each month. Councillor Van Elphen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just for clarity, the alternate can attend any of the meetings also, if they so choose to for informational purposes or whatever they want to do? I suppose so. I, 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 the way I always look at these is, is you know, you, you, you speak to the, um, to the liaison and uh, you don't want to be, uh, you know, being there um, trying to undermine the, the, the person who's being appointed as the liaison. So I, I, I would just say, you know, be respectful with each other and, and, uh, and, and communicate. Um, Councillor Barkwell, then Councillor Peak. The understanding I got from George, our session with George mm -hmm. Cuff, and I and, uh, just want to make sure I'm clear on that, is that as a rep, you don't really take any position or you're kind of there, you don't have a vote with the um, group that you're um, the liaison for, and uh, you might maybe make a few comments or something, but you don't really make any commitments or have much of a view because your view has to be saved for the council table, correct? That, that, that's yeah. certainly the way I look at it. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I think, well, one is, you, I think you do have to have some sort of affinity for the organization. If, if, you, if, if, if you're appointed to the Arts Council and you think um, the arts are a complete waste of time and, and, and we shouldn't even be, uh, you know, speaking to these people, then you probably shouldn't be the uh, liaison to that committee, right? Uh, so, but if, uh, you know, so I think you have to have some sort of um, uh, interest in, in what the committee is doing or, or the organization is doing. Uh, and and I, I think what I found is that uh, they want to, um, they might want to bounce thing, thing ideas off you as what what you might think council would react, you know, to to a certain proposal or something. And I think that's completely fair that you you tell them what you're, you know, make it clear that you're just one person on council. But this is this is kind of this is council's priorities or this is their direction. So I think, you know, you 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 be that back and forth. So, Councillor Peak. <coughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I think that that being both a liaison and uh, an alternate gives you an opportunity to be involved in the community. And if you're an alternate, then it, going at the same time as the uh, the one uh, being appointed keeps you abreast of what's going on with the committee. Um, but you don't have to go every time. Besides, these committees are lots of fun. It's really interesting to see what our community is doing on their uh, various committees, and it's just a really good opportunity to extend our work into the community. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's all about what's your motive. Um, if you're going there to, uh, because you don't trust the liaison, then that's not probably not the best motive motive for going. If if you're going there to, to yeah, build your own knowledge, then it's probably a good idea. So, you know, it's that's why communications with the other person is important. Um, so moving along to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, so Doug, Doug Patton was the um, was the um, the rep previously. Uh, I've, I've um, Councillor Betts expressed interest, and I've I've, pen, I've penciled uh, Councillor Betts in in for for the chamber, and um, with uh, Doug Patton as the uh, alternate. And since uh, Doug's not here, he he can't really argue that. <laughs> Um, so the next one is the Kettle Valley Railway Society. Uh, Councillor Patton was the um, liaison for that. Now speaking to him, he suggested we might just want to put that one on hold right now. He's not sure uh, if a liaison is really needed for that organization. So I'd recommend that we don't appoint anybody right now. Um, to, to the KVR Society so we get more clarity on, on whether uh, we even need a liaison to them or not and whether they want, want us. So, and when Doug Patton, uh, when Councillor Patton returns, we can um, talk to him further about that. That'd be my suggestion. Uh, for the Municipal Insurance Association, they meet once a year at UBCM, I, I believe. 
Um, Councillor Patton was uh, the, the liaison for that. And since he's not here, we can make him the liaison once again, I suggest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Councillor Barkwell and Councillor Van Alphen were, I don't know why they need two alter alternates, but they, you, you were the alternates previously to that, and so I suggest we, we, you were doing such a fine job. <laughs> we'll, we'll just keep you there. Uh, so the Okanagan Regional Library Board, uh, they meet uh, four Wednesdays a year uh, in, in the mornings, and Councillor Trainer uh, has uh, expressed interest in that with Councillor Bett as the alternate, if that works. And the uh, Southern Interior Municipal Employees Association, uh, traditionally that's the mayor who, who's, who, get, who draws that short straw, so uh, uh, I've penciled my name in for that with Councillor Patton as the alternate. And uh, basically, Simia, I don't even know when they meet, but uh, I think they, they basically just deal with uh, the benefits package for each municipality. So it's not really the most um, glamorous position, I'm afraid. Uh, so that's, that's what I've penciled in. I, I've tried to create um, uh, a balance so that, you know, not everybody's overloaded, but everybody kind of has something. Um, and uh, keeping in mind that, uh, that the advisory committees are being reviewed and, and there will be those uh, um, it coming at the future too. So, so uh, once we've, once we've know what we're doing with the committees. Um, so if, if we, I can open that for discussion or questions and uh, we can just uh, move forward. Any comments, questions? Councillor Peak. I think all those suggestions are good ones. Can I bring the motion forward with Absolutely. the names? Absolutely, yeah. So done. Yeah, seconder, Councillor Van Elfen. So corporate officer, did you get all those? Yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, uh, Councillor Barkwell. I don't see Councillor Van Elfen's name here for much. Maybe we could create something for him? <laughs> <laughs> We, we, well, Councillor Van, Van Elfen is um, on the RDS. That's one thing uh, worth worth keeping in mind, and uh, we'll find we'll find other stuff for him to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'll uh, call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Um, moving on to. The next item, which is the Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. Uh, and Fire Chief Robinson is, yeah, he's here. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't know if you guys had any questions or not. I kind of um, put it together while the election was going on and in between council meetings. So I did uh, forward it to the UBCM and now I'm just looking for a request for a decision. Report, support, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions? No questions? Would somebody like to bring the motion forward? Councillor Van Elfen? So, yes. Councillor Trainer, yeah. second. Any discussion? No discussion. I'll call the question, all in favor? None opposed, that carries. Thank you very much. Good presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so now we move on to the financial results and our Director of Finance, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the first nine months of 2022 has been very comparable to previous years uh, for the municipality. Operational revenue is on track across all funds with the majority of actual values surpassing budgeted figures. Uh, all categories are close to 75% of the budgeted amounts, with small differences largely due to year-end adjustments that will be recorded for actuarial earnings and transfers between funds at the end of the year. On the expense side, uh, all of the cost centers are below 75% of the anticipated overall budgeted amounts. Uh, many of the variances are simply just timing differences. Uh, within the related work being completed in uh, later fall months, 
which haven't been invoiced for, uh, or year-end adjustments that uh, won't be recorded until the fourth quarter. Uh, specifically, the lowest cost center is the general fund debt and transfers, which has uh, large MFA debt payments for which principal and interest uh, aren't due until October and December of 2022. So that's why that uh, is quite low. Uh, all other expense cost centers are over the 41% mark when compared to budgeted figures, uh, the majority having expenses specific to work being completed and invoiced in the fourth quarter. In reviewing the capital fund, uh, the year-to-date spending is 15.75% of budget. Uh, the value is lower than expected, uh, with a number of contributing factors, including project delays due to uh, staff turnover, supply limitations, and items no longer being required. Uh, it is anticipated a large portion of invoicing for the projects currently underway will be processed in the final months of 2022. Uh, in October, for example, uh, an additional $4 million was spent on capital projects, uh, increasing the year-to-date spending to approximately 30% of budget. Uh, so overall, the district is in a healthy financial position and uh, staff have not identified any concerns. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions? No questions. Uh, Councillor Van Alphen? I'll move the staff recommendation. Okay, thank you. The seconder. Councillor Peak. any discussion? Uh, okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? None opposed? That carries. Um, the financial plan amendment, uh, Director of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So on February 28th, 2022, Summerland Council adopted the 2022 through 2026 financial plan bylaw, which provides the legal authority for the district to expend funds. Since that date, Council has made numerous financial decisions that impact the financial plan. These decisions need to be incorporated into the financial plan as required by the community charter. So the proposed financial plan amendment bylaw does just that. Uh, the council report itemizes all of the required amendments and I'll just touch on a few uh, just to summarize. So the bylaw amendment includes a $21,562 increase to the grant and aid budget to help fund the roof replacement at the Summerland Youth Centre. This increase was funded through the Community Contributions Reserve Account, as council will recall. Uh, this also includes the reduction of $482,517 from the 2022 capital fleet replacement budget. Some fleet purchases were moved to different years while others had their original budget values adjusted. And the third item to note is, uh, it also includes the addition of an emergency management hazard risk and vulnerability assessment, as well as a community climate risk and vulnerability assessment budget uh, for $90,000. This project is budgeted to be funded through a $75,000 grant and a $15,000 transfer from the Climate Action Reserve. So the proposed bylaw amendment is ready for first three readings. And that concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Don't see any. Somebody wants to bring a motion forward. Councillor Peak. I'll bring the staff motion forward. Okay, for the first three readings. You. Seconder, Councillor Van Elfen, any discussion? I'll call the question, all in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, that carries. Thank you, and uh, 7.9, uh, budget timeline, Director of Finance. Again, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The purpose of this report is to provide Council with the proposed 2023 budget timeline. In all, there are six proposed meetings to specifically discuss budgets, rates, and Council priorities. Uh, the first meeting is scheduled for November 22nd. In addition to the budget meetings, there are two public open houses scheduled for December 5th and February 2nd. Uh, the first open house will focus on utility budgets and rates and is proposed to be delivered via Zoom as well as live streamed on the district's YouTube channel. The February 2nd open house will revert back to how we historically presented budgets to the public. 
Uh, the meeting will be held in the arena banquet room with all departments present to answer any questions the public may have. Uh, our hope is to have the five-year financial plan bylaw adopted by Council on February 27th of 2023. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so if I could just jump in first here. The only thing, either January Thursday, January 12th, or Thursday, January 19th, I'm not sure which one, but one of those would be an RDS day. So it means two of us wouldn't be here. Um, so that's one problem I see. Uh, uh, we'll know on Thursday. Uh, I, I can't remember if, so RDS is, do you remember Councilor Trainer? RDS is it the first and third Thursdays or the second yeah, or fourth? First, first and third Thursdays. So it would be uh, the 19th. That's the case. I, I think for just for future reference, any time on a Thursday, anything scheduled for Thursdays, you should probably clear with the RDS to make sure it's not a meeting day. And and kind of traditionally Thursdays and Fridays, that's when the RDS does all its business, so as not to uh, um, conflict with municipalities who tend to do their businesses Monday to Wednesday, so municipal councils. Can I pro propose a different date? Um, <clears throat> hopefully, the way this, the way January is shaping out to be, or at least the way we have it put forward, uh, the 17th and 18th would be the two main days. And then the 19th was just penciled in in case we needed a third day. So hopefully we don't need that day. But if we do end up jumping in, um, could we possibly shift that to the 20th, which would be the Friday. Would that work? It works for me. I don't know if it works for everybody else. But. Going off the premise that hopefully we don't actually need that day. Everyone's good with that? Yeah? Okay. Seems to work. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Peek. Just a point of clarification. The Zoom meeting for December 5th, um, are we in council chamber to do that Zoom or are we doing it off-site? So it's December 5th. It's a Zoom meeting that public can come in on and it's between 5 and 6 p.m. So Director of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the intention there is to follow how we did it last year, uh, Councillor Peak. We uh, the presentation was done by myself uh, in my office, okay. and Council attended through through Zoom. Uh, I believe most of you zoomed in from from your homes. Okay. Thank you very kindly. Any uh, further questions? Don't see any. Would somebody? Oh, Councillor Van Elfen. For the, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through to our Director of Finance. When are we going to get the proposed paperwork on this for the budget? For like the general budget for January. So through the Mayor to Councillor Van Elfen. Uh, <clears throat> Our intention is if our meeting is on this, if the budget meeting is on January 17th, you would have it a week previous. So the, what's seven? They're on the fifth, sixth, somewhere there. Sorry, 17th, we're on the 10th. Okay, no further questions. Does somebody want to bring the motion forward? Um, Councillor Van Elfen, um, as, amended? As, as amended? Yeah, okay. Uh, seconder, Councillor Peake. Uh, any further discussion? I'll call the question. All in favor? None opposed. That carries. Um, no bylaws for adoption. Uh, 
public comment. Anybody? Uh, Mr. Hacking, please come to the podium. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a, a quick uh, two things. First, uh, the motion regarding the um, the waterfront concept plan was the adopted or amended motion adopted, or was this the the motion as presented adopted? So the waterfront the trainer had an amendment, and yeah. I was unclear whether that was actually the motion that was voted on. And adopted. That's, yeah, the amended okay, motion was. Yeah. Um, just a, a bit of clarification or information, I guess. Um, if you go on Google Street View and just look at the park right now, it has a picture from, from 2012. All that's present at the site is the previously existing slide hazard signs that were there. Um, in 2016, when the horse issue came before council and an informational sign regarding that kind of use was placed at the park in the repairing area, it still is present today. And regarding um, a sign existing re uh, reflecting uh, use of dog site, um, in the last, I don't know if it was um, fall 2021 or this year, but a sign has been placed at the sign that does restrict dog uses, uh, reflecting the existing bylaws. But I do note that uh, the site never was on any district park plan until the last couple of years. And of course, Horse Beach is just a common name we've been using to call it. It's not a, hasn't formally been recognized as a name there. So I just want to clarify, there is a sign there that prohibits dogs. Um, I did talk with the uh, director of parks about this issue back uh, this spring and she advised as the um, parks plan was going through its process that they would be holding off on enforcement at that location. I just want to clarify there is a sign there that does prohibit dogs and that sign wasn't really there in 2016 and appeared sometime in between then and now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, no other people on the line, corporate officer, thank you. So I would like a resolution to um, close the meeting to the public. If so, so moved. Um, Councillor Van Elfen, second. Councillor Trainer. do we have to state why? It's, it's in, as stated in the agenda. Okay, um, all in favor? Uh, it's carried unanimously and um, we'll just give a minute for people to clear out. <clears throat> 